okay so um, in this video we are going to again um, um, focus on a kinematics related problem um, again involving um, kind of rigid bodies uh, but interconnected rigid bodies uh, through a joint and uh, we will use kinematic relations to solve for the unknowns uh, of this problem so uh, let me just quickly explain um, what you see here is a universal joint also called a cardon joint um, essentially uh, a universal joint is a joint that um, uh, helps transmit um, you know rotational motion from one axis to another when the two axes are not um, in the same direction um, in this case uh, what you see here is that the two axes are given are shown here this is one the the driving axis and this is the driven axis okay um, <clears throat> now the uh, driving axis and the driven axis they are both on the same horizontal plane but uh, they are not collinear in the sense that the driving axis is making an angle um, better um, with respect to the driven axis um, the driven axis is along y2 the driving axis is along y1 but in the opposite direction um, and the driving axis is so this is the driving and this is the driven um, of course in this case you can swap the driver and driven because the joint is such that it can equally transmit rotations um, from one side to the other and the other side back to the first one um, so the so in this case the driving axis is a y1 but oppositely directed driven axis is in y2 um, y1 is at an angle with y2 by by so it's it's offset from y2 by an angle beta and y1 and y2 are on the horizontal plane um, at the uh, at the connection point between the these two uh, rigid bodies uh, here we have this universal joint um, and essentially this universal joint it uh, connects uh, the bar CAE with DAB and uh, the point A is where the two joints can swivel uh, however uh, the Im important thing here to keep in mind that CAE and DAB will always remain perpendicular to each other so the two joints will always remain perpendicular to each other so CAE and DAB will remain perpendicular to each other but one can turn with respect to the other so one can turn with respect to the other but remain perpendicular so that's the uh, universal joint now the reason this problem uh, and, and by the way this angle beta is a constant angle now uh, we are representing um, um, the angle turned by the driven uh, driven shaft to be phi 1 and the angle uh, uh, sorry angle turned by the driving shaft to be phi 1 sorry and the angle turned by the driven shaft to be phi 2 now to understand this diagram a little bit better imagine that first with respect to y2 you have turned the y axis by an angle beta and that forms the axis of the driving uh, part of the joint then uh, imagine that uh, so what that does is uh, your x2 then moves to x1 by an angle beta as well so the rotation beta happens about the z axis or the z1 z2 axis right <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so x2 turns to x1 as we go from the driving to the driven um, or rather uh, let me just see here x2 is the axis of the driven and if you turn that x2 axis by an angle beta uh, 
that gives you the direction of the driving axis okay um, furthermore we are considering an arbitrary instant where the driven part of this joint has turned by an angle phi2 um, and the driving part of the joint has turned by an angle phi1 now the turn phi2 is actually the rotation of the shaft and it is happening about y2 whereas the turn phi1 is happening about the driving shaft and it is happening about y1 so so that's the setup of this problem and instead of and so in this problem uh, what we will show is the use of very simple kinematic constraints so solved using um, kinematic constraint so the way we solve this problem is that we uh, we make the following observation and that is um, CA and BA are always perpendicular to each other during motion and that is just uh, because uh, by the by the nature of the cardan joint where the two mutually perpendicular uh, uh, mutually perpendicular rectangles um, are assembled so they remain perpendicular uh, their axis can swivel but the two um, rectangles will remain perpendicular to each other in terms of their planes um, so in this case um, since CA and BA are perpendicular to each other we can simply impose the constraint that the vector c with respect to a dot the vector b with respect to a is equal to zero and the idea is that if we impose this dot product to be equal to zero we this will lead to a relation between phi1 phi2 phi1 phi2 and beta and from there upon differentiation we should get a relation between phi1 dot and phi2 dot which is required in this problem um, it may seem that the angular velocity of this uh, of this uh, if the angular velocity of the driving shaft is phi1 dot then the angular velocity of the driven shaft is basically just going to be phi1 dot cosine beta because the two axes are um, at an angle of beta however that's not the case as we will show as we do a more detailed and careful analysis and that is perhaps another feature we want to highlight through this problem that while it may seem that the driven angular velocity is just the driving angular velocity times cosine of beta owing to the fact that the two axes are separated by an angle beta that's not really the case um, there are extra terms that show up um, and we want to derive the exact expression of how the two angular velocities are related um, so we observe that um, rho c with respect to a is if we if we assume that the distance from c to a is um, let's say l1 then we have or let me call it l2 because that's the driven shaft uh, so we have L2 cosine phi2 
in the uh, K2 direction. plus L2 sine phi2 in the I2 direction and by I2 we mean the unit vector along X2 by K2 we mean the unit ve vector along Z2 and similarly uh, by J2 we will mean a unit vector along Y2 and similarly you can name the unit vectors along x1, um, x1, x2. Uh, similarly, you can name the unit vectors along um, x1, y1, and z1. Now further, let us write the unit vector, uh, or rather the vector from A to B and let us assume that the distance from A to B is L1 then you can see from the geometry that B to A can be easily expressed as L1 um, cosine phi1 in the I1 direction um, minus L1 sine phi1 in the K1 direction. Okay, and we also note that um, K1, the direction K1 is equal to the direction K2 since Z1 and Z2 are the same axis. Okay. So we have the expressions for these unit vectors. And next what we want to do is we want to carry out the dot product. Um, but however, uh, before we, so let me just write the vectors one more time so that I can use uh, some of this uh, space and have this diagram uh, showing on the top of the, um, on the top of the uh, video here. So uh, rho C with respect to A is L2 cosine phi2 K2 plus L2 sine phi2 I2 and rho B with respect to A is L1 cosine phi1 I1 minus L1 sine phi1 K1. Okay, so let's keep the diagram in our view. Now um, we cannot do the um, uh, dot product between these two readily because in this vector we are using I2, K2 so we are using the I2, K2, I2, J2, K2 uh, triads uh, and here we are using the I1, J1, K1 triad so we cannot readily do the dot product between these two vectors so what we need to do is we need to express one of these vectors using the triad of the other. So what we'll do is we'll note that k1 is same as k2 so we do not we need not worry about this term but in this term we have this i1 and we would like to what we'll do is we'll express i1 in terms of i2 j2 k2 and that can be done quite easily. You'll notice that i1 is in this direction and if you resolve along the x2, y2 direction, what you will have is i1 is equal to cosine beta i2 um, plus sine beta j2. Right? 
and therefore we can say that rho b with respect to a is l1 um, cosine phi1 cosine beta i2 plus l1 cosine phi1 sine beta j2 minus l1 sine phi1 k2 right and k2 is equal to k1 as we have noticed um, we have noted that in the previous page um, so now we can take this cross uh, this dot product so rho c with respect to a dot rho b with respect to a is going to be basically um, taking the product of corresponding uh, components so if we take um, the k2 components we have minus l1 l2 sine phi1 cosine phi2 and then if we take the i2 component and then multiply with the i2 component we have plus l1 l2 cosine phi1 cosine beta sine phi2 and because we are taking um, the dot product obviously it's no longer a vector um, the j component of c with respect to a is zero so that gets multiplied with the j component of b with respect to a and we have a zero so this is essentially the dot product and we set this to zero and so upon setting this to zero what we have is the following so we can cancel the l1 l2 from the two expressions and we have cosine phi1 sine phi2 cosine beta is equal to sine phi1 cosine phi2 right and this basically gives us um, tan phi2 cosine beta is equal to tan phi1 right now this relation uh, or rather this expression that we wrote where what we did is we took this vector b with respect to a in the i1 j1 k1 triad and expressed it in the i2 j2 k2 triad in this case it was quite simple because there was just one angle that was involved so we could do this by just visual inspection however it's not always um, easy to do these um, coordinate transformations because many a times in rigid body problems we have um, one rigid body rotated with respect to another or with respect to um, an inertial frame by multiple um, different angles and uh, so it's always a good idea to see if there is a structured way to do these coordinate transformations and fortunately there is one and it's quite easy here if we note that um, basically <clears throat> um, let me check one thing Okay, so we note that um, if we want to express this vector rho b with respect to a which is expressed using the i1 j1 k1 triad if we want to express it using the i2 j2 k2 triad then referring to this figure 
essentially I1, J1, K1 is turned by an angle negative beta that is beta about the negative Z axis to get I2, J2 and K2. So with that um, understanding we can now say that um, um, so our in I1, J1, K1 our components are L1 cosine phi1 0 and negative L1 sine phi1 and just for reference we are just going to make uh, a note that this is in the I1 direction, this is in the J1 direction and this is in the K1 direction. Now if we multiply this vector with the suitable rotation matrix and that rotation matrix is a matrix that represents a rotation of negative beta by the Z axis. So if you look at the standard um, rotation matrix in the Z axis and if you change the angle from uh, say beta to minus beta then the rotation matrix would be um, cosine beta minus sine beta um, 0 and sine beta cosine beta 0 and 0 0 1 so this is rotation by negative beta about z1 or z2 because they are they are the same so if you take this product then what we see or what we have is if you carry out these individual multiplications um, the first term you will get is l1 cosine phi1 cosine beta the second uh, entry that we'll get is L1 cosine, I mean this is cosine phi1, sorry, cosine phi1 sine beta and the last entry is L1 sine phi1. And so these are now the uh, components in the I2, J2, K2 directions and if you if you compare these components with what we have here you see that they are exactly the same the i2 component that we found out was l1 cosine phi1 cosine beta that's exactly what we have here the j2 component we found was l1 cosine phi1 sine beta which is what we have here through our matrix multiplication and the k component also agrees negative L1 sine phi1, negative L1 sine phi1. So this is basically showing that uh, we can take this structured um, rotation matrix approach um, to transform these vectors from one triad to the other. In any case, we now have the um, the expression that relates phi1 and phi2 the goal of this problem was to relate phi1 dot to phi2 dot or rather phi2 dot in terms of phi1 dot so we are going to take a derivative so let's call this equation equation 1 so we'll say differentiating one with respect to time we have um, 1 over cosine square phi 2 phi 2 dot cosine beta equals 1 over sine um, sorry cosine square phi 1 phi 1 dot let me just check uh, 
yeah or in other words we can say that phi 2 dot is equal to um, cosine squared phi 2 divided by cosine squared phi 1 divided by cosine beta phi 1 dot Okay. So we see the relation between phi two dot and phi one dot, and it is not just related by beta, but it also has phi one and phi two angles. Now we can replace um, this. Um, phi 2 to express everything in terms of phi 1 let me just do that derivation quickly so you can say that phi 2 dot is equal to um, Um, let's see, hold on. Now, um, now we have the identity, and that uh, which is that, um, um, 1 plus tan squared phi 1 is equal to 1 over cosine squared phi 1 and similarly 1 plus tan squared phi 2 is 1 over cosine squared phi 2 so we can then say that uh, we have 1 plus tan squared phi 1 divided by um, 1 plus tan squared phi 2 um, times cosine beta times phi 1 dot okay and now we can relate um, tan tan to, uh, phi 2 to tan phi 1 using this relation so we can we now have 1 plus tan squared phi 1 divided by 1 plus and tan squared phi 2 is tan squared phi 1 divided by cosine squared beta times cosine beta sorry this was out of the view phi 1 dot And so, if we simplify this, what we'll get is cosine squared beta, or rather cosine beta in the numerator. And in the denominator, we will have um, in the denominator we will have cosine squared beta plus tan squared phi 1 times cosine squared phi 1 phi 1 dot which can further be simplified to have cosine beta divided by um, sine squared phi 1 plus cosine squared phi 1 cosine squared beta times phi 1 dot. Okay. 
So now we have phi 2 dot expressed in terms of phi 1 dot and we see that indeed phi 2 dot is not just phi 1 dot times cosine beta it is actually being affected by the angle phi 1 as well so in other words if phi 1 is turning with a constant angular velocity phi 2 is not turning with that constant angular velocity which is just phi 1 dot times cosine beta it is actually turning with a variable angular velocity because that angular velocity depends on the angle phi 1 so in other words going back to this figure if phi 1 is turning with a constant angular velocity phi 2 is not turning with a constant angular velocity its velocity depends on the angle phi 1 and it's also a function of beta of course the fact that this is a function of beta is kind of intuitive because the two axes of rotation are at an angle beta with respect to each other however um, the kinematics tells us that it's not that the angular velocities are just dependent on beta but they also depend on phi 1 which means that as the whole thing turns the angular velocity of phi 2 can uh, vary even if phi 1 dot is constant so if phi 1 dot is constant phi 2 dot can still vary because the angular velocity not only depends on beta but it also depends on phi 1 and that is what is um, that is what we have from our derivation so this was a relatively simple problem uh, however this was interesting because it um, showed uh, how motion is transmitted in a um, cardan joint uh, or a universal joint and how um, it is the kinematic constraint uh, between the, the bars C A uh, C E and B D to remain perpendicular to each other um, that is the overarching constraint and within that constraint when you solve the the relation between the two angular velocities it turns out that um, it's it's if if one of the shafts is driven with a constant velocity the other will not have a constant um, output velocity but rather the velocity will depend on the angular position so um, this was a different kind of problem we did not use any of the relative velocity equations or didn't have to do um, go into accelerations and so on and so forth but nevertheless this did involve um, the connection of rigid bodies and so um, this is a useful problem to look into thank you so much